Did the Cincinnati Reds' expectations for the season change with the injuries that they've suffered in spring training? Some say yes, some say no. We'll give you both sides to that coin on today's Locked On Reds. You are Locked On Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Reds with myself, Jeff Carr, and also Steve Offenbaker will be along shortly, as will Charlie Goldsmith from the Cincinnati Enquirer and Austin Elmore from ESPN 1530 and 700 WLW. We are going to be previewing this season as we get you set for opening day. It's opening day eve right before. I hope you get your presents underneath the tree and you get everybody ready, get your cookies ready for it. No, I'm just kidding. But tomorrow is definitely Christmas because we love opening day here in the city of Cincinnati. And Locked On Reds is here for you all throughout the season, all throughout spring training, all throughout the offseason because we are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, every single day. I want to thank you for taking time out of your day to join us and talk some Reds. I encourage you, if this is your first time, make sure, and you're watching here on YouTube, make sure you drop into our comments section. Leave us any thought, leave us a question, leave us a take. We love hearing from you. Or if you're listening on your favorite podcast app, make sure that you hit us up on Twitter. You can hit me up at Jeff Carr with three Fs. You can hit up Steve at S. Offenbaker with two Fs. And you can hit up the show at Locked On Reds. All right, we got a lot of great stuff to cover for you here today. I mean, the changing expectations for this team, did, did they change at all? I think that there are two sides to that coin, and we present those two sides pretty well. We're also going to look at who will be this team's MVP when it's all said and done, and is the MVP different from the most important player? And later on, we are going to jump into outfield conversation. Are we worried about the outfield? That's all coming up on today's Locked On Reds podcast that is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app today and use the promo code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Well, it's finally here. Almost here. It's a day away. Opening day. The best day in Cincinnati, I'm not going to hear Christmas. I'm not going to hear Thanksgiving. I don't care about the Bengals opening of the season. It's opening day for the Cincinnati Reds. It's the most important day in the city. And that means that the season of anticipation, the hype that we have been building since October, September, was it the beginning of last year that the hype for this year started? I can't really tell because it feels like it's been building forever. But to help us out with this as we lead into opening day, joining Steve and myself, it's Charlie Goldsmith from the Enquirer and Austin Elmore from ESPN 1530 and 700 WOW. Gentlemen, as we as we head to opening day, let's get a vibe check on, on how we're feeling because it feels like the last 10 days, really, Everything's taken a hit with injuries, suspensions, all the other stuff. Where are the vibes at? And, and Austin, I kind of want to start with you on that. Well, if you asked me a, a week ago, I would have been that meme from Mad Men where I would have been saying, not great, Bob. Uh, but I feel like the way they ended spring training with somewhat good news about TJ Friedel, with just the end of spring training and the excitement surrounding opening day. I'm kind of drinking the Kool-Aid again that the vibes are higher about the Reds. I still think they're better than they were last year. I still think they have a ton of talent. So I've changed my tune from a week ago where it felt like the skull, the sky was falling. And now I'm just like, okay, they're still good enough to be competitive this entire season and be in the conversation. I'll tell you what the company line is. The company line is this is a group of guys who are like, Tell us when it's going to be normal. We look forward to seeing that as opposed to just the whirlwind that the last several years have been. They, they don't know it any other way. And when you combine that with the fact that they did respond well to that last year, the fact that it is a higher talent level than they had uh, overall organizationally top to bottom on this opening day roster, when you look at the flaws on last year's opening day team, I think there's a lot to overcome for these guys, but they can talk themselves into it. And the pieces certainly are there to give them some real upside. You know, the for me, it's obvious it's not the team we thought we were going to have for opening day. This is not what we expected. But when you compare last year's opening day to this year's opening day, even <laughs> with these injuries, this is still a better team. Luis Sessa is not in this rotation. Connor Overton is not in this rotation. Luke Weaver is not in this town. 
This is a better starting rotation. The bullpen has been tremendously upgraded. And even with the position player injuries, we're going to have a full season of Ellie De La Cruz. Spencer Steer is going to be more comfortable in left field. They brought in Jamer Candelario. This is a, a better opening day lineup, I think, than it was last season as well. Now, over the long haul, these injuries could keep them from doing that thing we said we wanted them to do, which is to run away with this division, have an overpowering April, and not look back. Uh, they're going to have to work for it a little bit more, I think. But while I was initially dampened by everything that went down, uh, the Noel V. Marte suspension in particular, uh, I still think that if, if I'm buying or selling on the Reds right now, I am buying. Yeah, I'm not. I don't think I'm any less bullish. I think the whole time I've I've had them pegged somewhere between 85 and 90 wins. I think I probably bumped that down a few with the injuries and the way that this season may begin. But I still think 85 to 88 is a very real possibility. And that's probably what takes the division. Now, as, as we get into that a little bit later on, um, I, I'm going to find it interesting to see your guys' responses to that. But with the way that the roster has changed and looking how much more pressure is on the pitching staff and how much more pressure is on the lineup that it, it felt like, a week or so ago or two weeks ago, um, they had enough guys that, okay, if for some reason CES is in a slump, then, you know, Ellie De La Cruz or Matt McClain will step up. If Matt McClain's in a slump, you know, all this other stuff. Now it feels like that margin for error has thinned. What do you look at when it comes to the players on this team and who's going to be the MVP when it's all said and done? Charlie, you want to start that one? Reds MVP, I'm going to go with, I mean, the safe bet's always going to be reigning Reds MVP, Spencer Steer. You can put Candelaria in this mix as well in terms of uh, on a team with so many ceilings and floors. I feel like those two are the guys you know exactly what you're going to get, specifically on an everyday basis, like Fraley and Benson, definitely more left-right splits in those guys. Um, I'm also really high on Graham Ashcraft. I think he has the potential to – I think he's flying under the radar. I was really impressed with the way his two-seam fastball looked in spring training. Um, even dating back into the offseason, like he's seeing some analytical, tangible strides with that pitch. And as Derek Johnson said, just statistically, when Graham's two-seam is two-seaming is the word he used, Graham pitches really well, and he avoids those lulls. So those would be the first guys that will come to mind for me. I have no factual basis in this feeling other than – I kind of want to be a little bit different, and also I just have a feeling I'm going to say Hunter Green. I think Hunter Green takes the step this year that we've all been waiting for him to take. A rough spring, he's working on new pitches, he doesn't get the opening day start, but we saw flashes of that last year. We've seen flashes of it for the last couple of years. This year, Hunter Green stays fully healthy makes all the starts he's supposed to make and puts the Reds on his back and puts that staff on his back and becomes a true ace and a true number one. I think Hunter Green is the Reds MVP this year. I think I am going to lean in a little bit because a question I'm going to ask you guys here in a minute to, will help explain this answer as well. But for most valuable player for me, I think it's going to be CES. I think CES is going to be the guy that, that sits in the middle of this Reds lineup hits tanks into the outfield seats and, and really is the, the catalyst for the run scoring, the run scoring that they're going to need at times while they're waiting for the overall offense to recover from some of these injuries. I think by putting him out there every day in the fourth spot, fifth spot, I'd like it to be the fourth spot and just kind of letting him cook all season long. I think that's going to make him the most valuable player on this team for 2024. And I think playing off that a little bit, the guy that's going to be on base every time he's hitting home runs, Ellie De La Cruz is going to be this team's MVP. I really there feel like he's taking that step forward. He's going to make this step, the whole plate discipline thing. He's going to get the pitch recognition down. I've seen it a little bit, not super consistently, and not you know the few times that they were on TV as opposed to what's on the radio, the few times that I've heard it consistently. I think that he is going to be able to take that step that he's taken at every single level of every minor league team that he has played on where he has that adjustment period, but he finds the groove. And when he hits that groove, he just goes crazy. And even just looking at some different things that he could do, if he is on base 
let's even just say 34, 35% of the time, his runs scored are going to go crazy high because he's going to have so many more at-bats this year. And he scored on 53% of the times that he made it on base last year, looking at you know runs scored as opposed to times on base. And that, that kind of number, I think, doesn't get worse. In fact, it could even get better with how he you know evolves in his base running style. But all of these different MVP picks has me thinking. And plus, we get into the conversation, is there a difference between MVP and most important player? That's coming up next. With baseball season finally upon us, the best way to enjoy each and every day's action is with Prize Picks. Download the Prize Picks app today and begin making your picks. You can make up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks. Download the app today and use the code Lockdown MLB. They'll match up to $100 on your first deposit. You can put together these great picks that can make you some cash off of their performances. I'm looking specifically for this opening day matchup of the Reds and the Nationals. Ellie De La Cruz, the over-under on runs scored in this game by Ellie De La Cruz is .5. So literally, if he scores one run, boom, you do it. You hit more on that. Plus, they have strikeouts, total strikeouts on Frankie Montas at five. You hit more on that, put those two together and then combine it with an interesting one that I like here the hits, runs, and RBIs. Price Picks has these great different stats that you can choose. They have the hits, runs, and RBIs set at one and a half for Lane Thomas for the Washington Nationals. Lane Thomas killed the Reds last year. So, you know, if he hits a home run, boom, that's it. You hit the more on that. So, Hit more on Lane Thomas, 1.5 hits, runs, and RBIs. Price picks is something we're going to be talking about all season long. It's a great way for you to make some cash off of the Reds' performances and their opponents' performances as well. So download the app today and use the code LOCKEDONMLB to get a deposit match on your first deposit of up to $100. Click more, click less. It's that easy. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Do you have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today. It's a free 24-7 streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or on the free Amazon Fire TV channels app part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And coming up on the next Locked On Reds podcast, we actually got more of this conversation. It couldn't fit all into one episode. We've got a bonus episode coming out for you later today where we give you our predictions. We tell you whether or not the Reds are going to make the playoffs and why not all of us agree on that. That's going to be on the part two slash bonus edition of our conversation with Charlie Goldsmith and Austin Elmore. But let's jump back into it right now with them as we look at, you know, who is the most important player on the Reds this season. But I also think that it's great because I've, I was feeling this the whole time about Ellie De La Cruz and you guys all said different things. It just shows how good this team is compared to where we were last year. Yeah, like we mentioned, Jason Vossler's not walking through that door. I'm so Kevin glad Newman. I don't have to talk about Jason Vossler <laughs> on opening day. I'm so glad. Which except, he homered last except, opening day, but yeah. No, he except, did. Austin, you may not you may not know this, you guys, Charlie and Austin, but I was in the stadium and and Vossler had gone through a, an Ofer streak, and I'm sitting in the had stadium. Had a few beers. And in them. Had a few beers. I'm on my phone, and the tweet was, why is Jason Vossler even on this team? Send <laughs> crap. Like seconds, there was. seconds apart. Oh, but I think better than that. But I think that's just such a huge, a huge, huge part of this. I mean, the fact that the team itself is so much better. And when these guys get back from injuries, and I know that we're still kind of waiting on a concrete update with Matt McClain, mm -hmm. I, I think that that is. There's so many different guys that when they get back you will begin to see the way that the roster was supposed to rotate whenever Nick Crawl made all those moves. Yeah, and uh, my colleague, Lance McAllister, back at the beginning of spring, did this this segment about how 
the Reds are replacing almost 22% of their total at-bats last year between Will Myers and Nick Sinzel and Jason Bossler and all these guys and Kevin Newman that played all these different roles. There's 22% of the at-bats that have to be replaced with this team. Now, obviously, TJ Friedel, Noel V. Marte, not going to be a part of that for the first couple of months. But when you look at look at it just from that number, you're replacing those that percentage of at-bats with better players, with better hitters. I, I think that's going to bode well for the offense. Yeah, I'm overall optimistic. I'm overall optimistic about the Reds in this lineup. But, you know, one reason I'm at 81 wins right now as opposed to 86 or 87 or 88 is this organizational depth. And, you know, this is nothing that anyone wants to hear on an opening day preview talking about who's going to be hitting in the outfield for the Louisville Bats lineup last year or this year. But last year, the Reds started the year with in Louisville, you know, Strand and McLean and Marte was coming up the pipeline and Ali De La Cruz was. And there was kind of the second wave of replacements. And if you're asking one of the biggest concerns internally, the Reds really kind of have to on the fly here this season find out where they can find more depth. They don't have it right now, and that's definitely being highlighted as they get ready for the season. Well, let me ask you guys this before we move off of, of the major league uh, level and the importance of players. Do either of you guys think there is a difference between the most valuable player and the most important player? And I ask that because I gave the answer of Christian Encarnacion Strand as the most valuable player. I think he's going to feast in the middle of this lineup. He's going to have an opportunity to put up big numbers based on what everybody else is doing. But when we look at the most important player, I, I circle back to what Charlie had to say. And for, in my mind, Spencer Steer might be the most important player on this team because he's going to give them that flexibility to your point, Charlie. If something goes wrong on the infield, maybe they can get him onto the infield to cover and, and help and help band-aid a weakness. Uh, if everybody's back on the infield, he's been willing to learn a new position, volunteered to go to the outfield. He gives you a band-aid out there. And really your only intimidating right-handed hitter, as far as outfielders go on this team right now, uh, no disrespect to Stuart Fairchild, but he's going to have to prove it to me uh, before I'm ready to label him an everyday righty all the time. So do you guys find a difference between most valuable player, and most important player? I do. Um, I think the Reds have two paths to the playoffs this year. One of them is the big three, you know, what we coined last year in the rotation. They all pitch up to that upside and they carry this team and become the strength of the team along with Montas and Abbott. The other path is Ellie De La Cruz is an all-star and sustains that and the Reds make the playoffs. And kind of the, the reason I think Ellie's the most important is, you know, without McLean and without Marte, the Reds don't have a backup shortstop. You know, Santiago Espinal is on paper the backup shortstop right now, um, but the Reds don't have another path. It has to work with Ellie, and I think it will work with Ellie. I think he had a very, very encouraging spring. But now that spotlight's even brighter. There is no backup plan. You're jumping off, you know, uh, a leap of faith to, to use the uh, the Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse, one of my favorite movies <laughs> metaphor. That's what this season is with Ellie right now. You know, Miles Morales got the job done. I think Ellie has some similar tools. That would be a fun player comp, Ellie De La Cruz and Miles Morales. But it's definitely that leap of faith type moment for Ellie. I think just, my most important player is still the guy that I would have said two, three weeks ago and a guy that they're not going to get for six or seven weeks and is TJ Friedel. Just what he's able to do defensively, you feel better about him in center field. His ability to hit left-handed pitching, his ability to drive the ball, his ability to bunt the ball, his ability to steal bases, like getting him – we all know the importance of the first month of the season how bad this team has been at that. If he's able to come back within a reasonable time, let's say it's that six to seven week mark, like David Bell said, that can provide a real jolt to this team. And I think he can be just as important even after missing six or seven weeks as he would be from the very beginning of the season. I'm still on the TJ Friedel train. I think he can be an all-star caliber player. And if he's able to be that, even if he comes six or seven weeks late, I think that's going to be really, really important to their success. Well, Austin, yeah. you kind of hit on it too, because I, he went down and that's where the panic really started to set in, yeah. right? Like we all had the same reaction. Like, oh my God, what are they going to do? So, so you, you may, you may have hit it spot on there. I think that's too, one of the reasons why I don't necessarily, I think I'm picking Ellie as the most important, but I also could see Will Benson making that argument because if Will Benson doesn't take a step forward defensively, then you really can't play him in center field with any confidence. And you can't really make a case that he should play every day with a lot of confidence. Although right now there's only four outfielders on the team. There's, there's, it's really nowhere to hide anybody that has any sort of deficiencies. Plus at least early on, it feels like they're going to play 
Will Benson every day. And Mm -hmm. we have seen a tiny sample size of him against lefties and he hasn't done anything against them. He doesn't hit lefties very well, albeit I I think it's like something like 48 at bats. So I'm not going to go crazy about the 48, but it gives us a little bit of a taste of what we can expect. I know he's been working a lot on that, uh, you know, over the off season. And as we headed into spring training and all that different stuff, if you were kind of asked to pick one or the other this season, what happens, what do you think is more likely to happen? Will Benson becomes an everyday player or one of Blake Dunn or somebody in in house gets called up and becomes a big part of this lineup. This whole conversation has me thinking, and I am a little bit worried about the outfield. So what's that going to look like all year long? We'll get into that coming up next. Game time is the best way to get to the ballpark, period, plain, and simple. When it comes to the last-minute deals that you're looking for, when it comes to finding the diamond in the rough when you're looking for tickets, game time is the way to do that. Check out the Game Time app today. Download it and use the promo code Locked On, and you'll get twenty dollars off your first purchase. There's so much going on with Game Time as we head toward opening day. It's a lot of great stuff for you to take advantage of. They even have deals for continuing users, not even just new users. But if you're like me and you have the Game Time app, you can use the promo code First Pitch to get twenty dollars off a purchase of one hundred and fifty dollars or more. So download the Game Time app today. It's my favorite way to get to the ballpark. It's Steve's favorite way to get to the ballpark. We go down, hang out at the banks, find some last-minute deals, get into the ballpark nice and easy. Game Time helps you out. They've got the last-minute tickets to the lowest price, guaranteed. Download the app and use code LOCKEDON for $20 off your first purchase. And use the code FIRSTPITCH for $20 off a purchase of $150 or more. Join the Lockdown Reds insiders today. I've revamped the program for this season, and I want you to be an insider. For $4.99 a month, you will become a smarter Reds fan and get all of the latest updates, including getting a direct text line to me. Text INSIDER to 513-597-0944 and get a free 14-day trial to see if you like it. Again, Text the word INSIDER to 513-597-0944 and get a free 14-day trial today. I think Charlie knows where I'm going with this because I was blowing his phone up during spring training saying, play Will Benson every day. And uh, I haven't been sending as many text messages the last couple of weeks. Um, But I I do think (laughs) it could happen. I think that Will Benson can be an everyday player. Uh, Charlie would have a better understanding of that, having seen him up close uh, over the last couple of weeks in Goodyear. But to answer your question in a short way, yes, I think he can be that player. It just comes down to the consistency, not only in the field, but also in the batter's box. And Charlie, I, I'm sure you were laughing on the inside hearing that question, knowing where I was going. Great, great. I'm just pointing out great question, Jeff. That is a fantastic 10 out of 10 uh, opening day preview podcast question. I wasn't opposed to at the start of the spring, Will Benson being an everyday player. I thought that it wasn't realistic for the Reds because of just how many guys they had, right? You're like, if Will Benson's not an everyday player, then how are you getting stranded in the lineup? And I know they play different positions, but with how they'd use the DH spot, like the math just didn't work. I'm genuinely like, this is going to be a big, interesting evaluation spot for Will. I think he can do it. I think his pitch recognition is the best on the team. And I think they give him a really stable foundation for what he can do against left-handed pitching. You mentioned his defense. I also think he's the most improved defender on the team. Will said during the offseason, he studied every Reds pitcher, which was fascinating, specifically to improve his first steps and his reads and his ability to have a better idea and understanding. He says, last year, I was kind of flat-footed. I was like... All right, the ball's hit, and then I react. Benson said he's seeing tangible differences. Colin Cowgill said he's seeing tangible differences. Mm. This is a really cool spot for Benson to show what he can do as an everyday player, as someone who plays more center field. He's only 25, too. Like, this is right on track with his development. He has a chance to set himself up for his whole career coming out of the gate right here. Interesting, neither one of you guys talked at all about Blake Dunn. And last week, after watching some Will Benson at bats, I started to entertain the idea of would it be better to let Blake Dunn figure out major league pitching against left-handers or let Will Benson try and learn to hit left-handers. And I'm still, I'm still a toss up. 
I'm still a coin flip. I think what makes sense to me is you go ahead and start off with Will Benson, but a short leash. And if he goes the first O for three weeks when he has to face a lefty, you've got to make a move because what this team can't afford to do is fall way behind in April. That has been the death knell of this team season after yeah. season after season is getting crushed in April. And they cannot let that happen again this year. Uh, this team, while it's waiting to get everybody back, is not going to be able to play catch up like you would hope. So for me, I would give Will Benson a leash, but it would be a short one. Uh, it, I would buy... By mid-April, I would be ready to start making an evaluation of are we going to continue this or are we getting somebody else in here? Well, as a card-carrying member, the first card-carrying member, I think. You're the hey. founder, my friend. Yeah, yeah, the founder of the Will Benson fan club. I think he can do it. <laughs> and while I was, you know, powering that push card up the hill with Chad Dotson, early on in the season, he gets <laughs> sent down to AAA. You know, we're really trying to keep this train rolling, and he comes back and he does it. And I think that there's something to be said about a guy that can overcome doubts. And at that point, the doubt was, can you be a major league hitter in any capacity? He overcame that. Now he has to overcome the de the defense and the left-handed pitching side of things. I think I have more confidence that he overcomes the defense because a lot of what he had was just reps and he just needed more reps in the major leagues, the route running and stuff like that. I feel like that's something you can teach. The left-handed side of things is a little bit more difficult for me being a left-handed hitter myself. Now, Granted, I stopped in high school. Uh, was <laughs> you have to use the term. A, you got to um, use the term a left hitter very, hitter very, very loosely. <laughs> no way. It's much more of a, uh, you know, sunflower seed aficionado and, and sign stealer than I was anything else. But no, I, I, I know the, the weirdness of left-handed pitching and how it's hidden from your right eye. And I think that that's going to be fascinating to watch him develop in that regard. But that was just something that, you know, thinking about this team, because that's my biggest concern is the outfield. And, and how it moves through 162 games, that's where I kind of come up with him being, at least in the conversation of being the most important player, because we know Spencer Steer's going to hit, and we know that he's going to out-hit his defense, whatever his defense ends up being, because his defense isn't going to be as bad as Adam Dunn's. And Adam Dunn once played left field for a long, long time, and we love Adam Dunn. And I think that Spencer Steer can be better than that defensively and be a very consistent hitter on top of that. It's just how does it move without T.J. Friedel? What's Jake Fraley to this outfield? What's Stuart Fairchild to this outfield? Mm -hmm. And then the mystery 26th man that probably by the time we post this, we will know uh, who that person might be. How do they factor into this outfield as well is kind of my biggest concern as far as the position group goes. Let's put these guys on the spot a little bit because we can and if they don't answer we can just cut this but charlie who's going to be the 26th man let's let's uh, let's just put it out there i've been scouring the waiver wire just like, and that's that's all, that's what this is they're looking mm -hmm. and it's impossible to know what the toronto blue jays are going to do with their why did i say the blue jays of course that's Votto. Oh, wow charlie but, wow yeah, joey Votto, the 25th <laughs> nice. man. what the los nice. angeles angels are going to do with their 26th man um other guys in-house bubba and her to be seem to be like the leaders in the clubhouse. I go with Herdebees. Herdebees is a old school, gritty, grindy, gets on base, doesn't look pretty, but, but, but he's gotten it done at every level kind of profiles as a, a fourth, fifth outfielder bench speed, late game replacement type. Um, I, I probably lean towards Herdebees of the in-house options. Can I'll they say really bring another left-hander? I mean, that would basically leave Luke Maley as the only righty off the bench, right? They, they could. Yes. Because they have enough. usually, like usually they have a good lineup of nine guys for a left-handed pitcher. And then the rest of the bench is lefties. Anyway, that's historically how it's been. And because Benson's going to get that crack against lefties, I'd feel comfortable having him do that. So yes, you do have that spot to work with. Um, if you want another lefty, I don't get the sense that lefty righty is too big of a factor, more just the best available player, really defense and base running um, as well. Sorry, I know I cut you off, Austin. Go ahead. I, I was going to say Joey Votto just for the cinema of it, uh, but no, <laughs> I'll go with uh, I'll go with Bubba Thompson uh, just for the sake of argument. Uh, I, I, to be honest, I'm not sure. I mean, I think Charlie's point about them looking at the waiver wire and maybe finding somebody that fits that mold for them over the first couple months of the season is is likely if it's not one of those younger guys. And I do think that your your point a minute ago, Steve, kind of plays a role in this as well. 
the idea about the short leash. I mean, we know about the pressure on the players uh, this uh, this season with the expectations of them being good, but there's also pressure on the front office as well. And I wonder how much that will affect decision making. You saw them go and acquire Santiago Espinal immediately. And, and I wonder just how short the lease is from an organizational standpoint as a whole over that first month, month and a half of the season, and how decisions like this will be made with that in mind. That was part one of our conversation with Charlie and Austin. Part two, a bonus episode, is coming out a little bit later on here today. Make sure you check that out. Before we get out of here, though, wanted to remind you, hit that subscribe button. That way you don't miss anything we've got coming for you all season long. Going to be here delivering you content, delivering you the newest information and the best takes when it comes to your Cincinnati Reds because we are Locked On Reds every single day.